live. Um, so we'll be talking on Zoom, but then it will stream to the to the live to to YouTube. Okay. Let me just have a look. Apparently, we are live. Let's see. Okay. Let me just make sure that it's coming up. Okay. Yes, so we are live. Okay. Right, to start. So hello, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I'm Rowena Abdurazak from the Iranian Studies Collective, and uh, I make it sound like a team, but it's actually just me. And it's our first live streaming session. And um, I, I hope this is the start of many other live sessions because I think it's really nice to have on the go, you know, um, conversations and to get that kind of free flow uh, discussion. So I really hope that this will be the start of something. And to kick off, we have uh, two very distinguished speakers. We have Dr. Bill Figuero, uh, who's, who's gonna wave. <laughs> and he's just defended his uh, thesis at UPenn and he worked on China and the Iranian left and looked at the transnational networks from 1905 to the revolution, I, I believe. Mm -hmm. And then we've got Jacopo Sita, who's also going to give us a little wave, who is at Durham University and he's doing uh, his, his doctoral research on the role of China in the um, Iran deal. So today we're going to look at and we're going to talk about the Iran-China deal, the the recent Iran-China deal, and we're going to look at whether it really is a big deal or not. We're going to talk about the implications, and we're just going to have a general chat. Anyone who's watching, please feel free to drop us a line in the chat box in the YouTube on the YouTube page, and we'll we'll, we'll address it as it comes along. So to start with, um, what is the Iran-China deal? <laughs> Bill, basics, basics, basics. All right. So the ba I mean, the basics of the Iran China deal, um, I, I suppose you have to start with what people are saying it is, if you really want to understand why we're even having this discussion, because if I just told you what it was, you might not know. Uh, so mm -hmm. what people are saying it is, is a uh, basically a pact, an alliance, uh, a, a binding agreement of some sort between Iran and China uh, to the tune of four hundred billion dollars. Um, mm -hmm. That's kind of the baseline. Uh, depending on who you're asking, you get all sorts of little add-ons, like it may result in military bases uh, yes. by China and Iran, or it may result in, you know, the buying of Iranian land uh, by China, or even just generally that this 400 billion represents a concrete set of projects um, that have been set up in areas of uh, cooperation and defense, uh, in uh, trade, uh, in international banking, in uh, you know uh, international uh, criminal law, uh, 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 in law enforcement, things like that. So that's what's being said. What the deal actually is is a what I like to call an aspirational document. It's a um, a kind of an, a, you know a kind of boilerplate. What is it? Maybe Jacopo, what is it like 15 or 16 pages long? It's not even really that lengthy. I mean, there's yeah. not that there's not enough space to lay out the kind of projects they're talking about. Um, but maybe you can talk a little bit more about what specifically is in the deals now that I've told you what's not in the deal, which is everything I just said. Yeah, so so Bill basically said the most interesting thing, which is what is not this deal, actually. <laughs> Sorry, I took the good part. <laughs> <laughs> goes a little bit against the backdrop, as, as they said, of what has been has been generally said about this deal. So, um, well, I, I want to say one thing before. Uh, first of all, this is not a new thing. So we are mm. talking about this um, this deal right now because it was finally signed. Uh, what was that? Two weeks ago, something like that, at the end of uh, of March. But actually, this is something that was on the table since January 2016. So uh, for mm. us that are looking into China Iran relations this is this is not news basically mm. uh, and the the strange things maybe and we can discuss about this later is that to uh, finally you know signing this deal it took five years which is mm -hmm. quite telling of, of some of the dynamics that are going on in China Iran relations so what is in this deal well this is another good question actually even if I, I said that that bill answered the the, the, the better one um, is because Actually, we don't have the final document uh, yet out, which uh, you can say, okay, so what are you talking about if, if we haven't seen the, the final document yet? What we know is that last summer there was um, 
a leaked draft uh, document, uh, which uh, basically, you know, was the, the final, uh, or at least was at the moment the final draft of the document was six months ago, seven months ago, something like that, around July. And uh, recently, uh, the Iranian foreign minister, so Javad Zarif, uh, confirmed that that document was true, was not uh, you know, something uh, thrown in by cheaters or whatever, or Iranian political opposition or so on. So we know that that document was true. Um, and uh, you know, we can guess with, with some certainty that uh, the document uh, is, and the final document is, is quite similar to what we have seen last summer. Uh, there's not been probably a lot of changes in, 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 in the final document that has been signed. Uh, and if we look back at that document, what we see is basically is, uh, first of all, the continuation and the elaboration of what the two countries uh, discussed and signed in January 2016. So there was this um, round of understanding in 2016 uh, that was public, you know, if you go on the um, Iranian government website uh, and, and so on, you will find uh, these documents and you will see that, you know, uh, there was a shorter, even shorter version. The, the document that was leaked last summer was 16 pages. Uh, yeah, 16 pages, something like that. Um, and basically, you know, it talks about everything. So it talks about that the two countries want to expand the relationship in uh, all the possible manners. Uh, and indeed, this is a comprehensive strategic partnership, so it makes sense. Uh, the, the two countries, well, of course, the bulk of that is, is uh, oil, because, of course, um, for China, Middle East relations, oil remains the, the, the center of, of uh, everything. Uh, so basically there was this quite strange, I would say, line saying basically that Iran will, will remain, you know, um, China's favorite or most important um, provider of oil, something like that, which uh, it's, you know, sounds very interesting, sounds very big. At the end of the day, uh, it's non-binding and, you know, uh, we know that, that countries buy oils uh, based on how much it costs, how much discount they can get. So uh, hard to see that, you know, Iran will have a special place in China's uh, supply because of this deal. Uh, also, there were interesting mentions on another uh, crucial aspect, I would say strategic aspect, like, you know, uh, cooperation in defense industry, uh, anti-terrorism, um, what else, uh, cybersecurity, but again, what I would say is that, and we can deep, uh, we can deep dive into all these aspects uh, during the conversation, but this is not something new really. So uh, Iran and China, and Bill is, is a historian, so he knows better than me, have cooperated to some extent in all this aspect in the, in the last 50 or so years. So this is, this is not very new. I mean, and, and as he said, it's very much aspirational. So. This is, uh, you know, and we will get to that, but this has been defined by Iranian and Chinese authorities as a roadmap for uh, expanding cooperation in the next 25 years. And I would finish my, my bit here saying, um, stealing one of the things that my, my colleague and, and, and friend Jonathan Fulton said about this deal, which was, you know, this is what these two countries want to do, aspire to do in an ideal situation uh, in the next 25 years. So. The situation right now is not ideal. Uh, Twenty-five years is, is a basically too long time span to imagine, you know, um, and, and to even talk about real accomplishment is is so big that we can, you know, you can play within it as much as you want. Uh, and so, yeah, that's that's basically my my first bit. So, yeah, I'd also like to just cool. add to that real quick. I mean, just based on the last thing you said. Um, you know, it's it, it, the ideal situation that they would be looking for is an environment in which they can, you know, sort of openly and cleanly do business. And the main, um, you know, uh, uh, impediment to that is U.S. sanctions. And so therefore, uh, the relationship between Iran and China. Uh, so, so one of the things that I've been saying, I may or may not have taken this from another colleague, I don't know, uh, you know, but it's, it's that Iran and China, uh, you know, Iran-China relations improving are contingent 
on US-Iran relations uh, improving. So all the talks going on with the JCPOA right now, you know, whether they are or aren't impacted by this deal, whether China is uh, trying to press. Bill, I think. Bill, um, yeah, we can't hear Bill, you. Bill, I can't hear. We can't hear you, Bill. <laughs> okay. That's fine. Well, that's My technical me. glitch there. I mean, but uh, while while Bill is while, while Bill is sorting himself out, I mean that's the thing that I mean, he he was just he just touched on it, and that was what about the relationship with the U.S. Yeah. So so the West is panicking. They see this bill and they panic. So is, is there? What is the impact of the Iran-China deal on the 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 JCPOA? Oh, okay. Uh, that, that's that's a very good question. Um, again, it's it's quite hard to to give a definitive answer on that. Mm. What we know is that China, um, historically speaking, and right now, okay, Bill is back, but I'll let me fix it. Sorry, okay, he's back. Okay, that's it. Sorry, Bill, we were just uh, talking can, over you. That's that's fine. Yes, can we hear can hear you. We can hear you. Okay, perfectly. that's fine. Okay. Yeah, no, I was pretty so much finishing saying? up. Jacobo sounds like he's about to say what I was saying, so please continue. <laughs> no, no, I, 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 I basic yeah, I basically just asked about what what the what the iran china deals impact will be on the jcpoa so um yeah so um well basically obviously th there's no answer there's no simple yes yeah. no answer to that uh mm -hmm. what we know are uh, a couple of things first of all that historically and currently china favors are torn to the jcpoa they are pro mm -hmm. jcpoa if one put it yeah. like that uh, so arguably, I would say that um, as something that I, I, I said a couple of times, I wrote on Twitter or whatever, or whatever I wrote it, that you know um, <laughs> maybe it's not it's not that the deal itself that that is important, but I'm sure that when Wang He, so the Chinese Foreign Minister, was in Tehran to sign the deal, I'm pretty sure he talked quite a lot with uh, Iranian authorities about uh, the talks in Vienna about the JCPOA and so on. Um, if I have to, you know, say it's good news or it's bad news for the JCPOA, I would say it's good news, actually, because uh, based on the fact, again, that China is interested in our return to the JCPOA, I think, you know, um, they they will somehow they can use this deal to further push Iran to the negotiation table. Uh, certainly, on the other side, it's also true that Iran will, you know, use and, and probably is trying to use this deal to um, you know, gain some little, I would say, political leverage and saying, okay, mm. you see, you try to isolate us with maximum pressure. Well, you, you, you didn't have success. Uh, you know, we cut a, a fantastic 25 years comprehensive strategic deal with China. So you, know, you put all of effort in cutting us off. You see that that's the result. Right. So right. this gives, I think, you know, um, some sort of political uh, brief of political fresh air to Iran, if you want to say like that. Uh, but again, I think, you know, if we if we try to, you know, uh, take away all the noise that this deal made, all this political noise, at the end of the day, I think it's good news for the JCPOA. Uh, and I see, you know, we, I mean, that, that can be just, you know, um, random or, uh, but, but, you know, if we think about that exactly, what was that one week later, uh, the deal was signed, or the week later the deal was signed, you know, actually China, uh, actually Iran came back to the table of negotiation, and right now there are negotiations going on, so you can read into that and saying, okay, you know, this China pressure, or the China leverage worked quite well, but we will see what will happen. Yeah, that's oh, definitely, yeah, that's uh, I have this, this, a similar reading, and in regards to the last thing you said, um, you know, uh, it, I'm a little more skeptical that it has direct pressure. I think you're, you're definitely right that they're talking about it. Um, you know, whether China is going to actually impact whether the United States is willing to return to the table, uh, whether Iran is going to make any concessions, that's a totally different question. Uh, my, my read of the, the two events happening so close to each other is that they're actually kind of spurred by the same source. And that is a new administration in Washington, the Biden administration mm -hmm. is looking for a new way forward on the JCPOA. So those deals were already going on. And China's interest in re reviving this talk right now is directly related to the possibility of the Biden administration making progress or returning to the JCPOA. Because the progress on the talks halted for the most part while Trump was in power, while the maximum pressure policy was in place. 
So, I mean, I'm not saying it's entirely coincidental, but I'm saying that if, if there is not a direct correlation between the two, that is why they're occurring at the same time, because they are partially motivated by uh, the change in, in the guard in American foreign policy, or at least the possibility. I mean, personally, I see Biden's foreign policy right now as um, a bit aggressive, especially towards China. Um, it remains to be seen towards Iran. Um, but, you know, it's been quite clear for some time that if, you know, America is going to return to the JCPOA, um, that some amount of sanctions removal is going to have to come first. Uh, and they don't seem to be open to that. At the same time, Iran doesn't seem open to, you know, budging on their position to that. So we're kind of just at the same standstill as far as I can see as we have. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's so interesting. So, I mean, it, it's, um, I guess it's still a question mark about the impact of the deal on, on the JCPOA. But could the, I mean, I'm, I'm curious about China's role. I mean, I'm not an expert at all. So I'm just going to, as you both, and you, you, you two are the expert. But um, what I'm curious about is China's role. Is this an assertion of China's um, power in the Middle East? Hmm. Because they're trying to get more, they're trying to be more assertive and more authoritative and they want to have more influence. Things like Israel, Palestine, they want to get more involvement. So is this a part of that? Um, well, Bill, go on. Yeah, sure. I, um, I, I can start with kind of the historical section and you can kind of talk yeah. about modern Iran-China relations more recently, Yakubo, I think, better than I can. Sure. Um, so, I mean, historically, oh, okay, <laughs> sure. but I mean, historically, uh, historically, China has had um, an interest in the Middle East, a small but growing one, a uh, strategic interest since, you know, I would say uh, the late 1980s. Um, there was a, a interest in sort of politically getting involved in the Middle East, um, starting after the, uh, the Chinese revolution um, and really picking up an earnest during the cultural revolutionary period uh, in the 1960s and 70s. That's when you see um, a lot of this sort of support, uh, Chinese support for um, yeah, guerrilla movements in the Middle East. Uh, so for example, the Dofar Liberation Front, um, which is quite close to Iran that had a direct impact. Um, uh, also, there was, uh, China was one of the first countries to uh, support the Palestinian guerrilla movement with small arms. Um, but it's also important to note that even at the height of this, you know, this revolutionary period of China's foreign policy, um, there was and always has been a kind of counter or, you know, balancing faction, if you want to call it. You know, I'm, I'm simplifying quite a bit here because there are multiple factions with multiple competing interests within the Chinese state. But if you want to kind of simplify things, you can think of it as, you know, in, in addition to these revolutionary forces and, and the multiple, you know, multiple forces, there are also multiple forces that were interested in more traditional um, diplomatic relations. Um, China has always had as a goal to break out of what it saw as diplomatic isolation uh, following uh, the Chinese revolution and ascending to the, uh, the post of the China position at the UN, which until the 1970s was uh, occupied by uh, Taiwan, the nationalist uh, government after it fled. Uh, so as a part of that, China, you know, at the same time as it was supporting these revolutionary movements on the one hand for domestic reasons and for ideological reasons, it was also making overtures towards uh, various uh, governments in the, uh, the Middle East. And Iran was actually probably the most um, significant one that was in its sights. Uh, the other Arab states, they largely thought were kind of a lost cause in terms of being more interested in the Soviet Union or having little to really offer them other than... Um, uh, sort of rhetorical support for the Palestinian cause. But in the case of Iran, there was a sense that there was actually a chance of, you know, tempting them away from what they were seeing at that time as the American camp. If you look at Chinese documents, they talk about the Iranians having one foot in the, the Chang, the, you know, the, the Chang bandit camp, meaning the, you know, the camp of Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of the nationalists, which they consider to be bandits, you know. Um, so that's, I mean, that's, and that's the only thing that they say about Iran in, for example, the 19, um, the uh, uh, Bandung Conference in 1955. They're sort of, sort of sorted into this category of, of countries with one foot in the camp of Taiwan and one foot in the camp of the so-called third world. Um, so th there's really this balancing act throughout um, the, the history of China and Iran's in, uh, connections in the 60s and 70s, where on the one hand, they're supporting uh, Iranian Maoist militants, although they are not supporting them crucially with military technology or um, direct support that would actually cause any revolution in the country. And at the same time, they're making overtures towards the Iranian government. Uh, and this kind of comes into the open in 1972, the Iranian government for various reasons of its own 
um, partially actually out of fear of the uh, popularity of Maoism amongst Iranians and the you know, implication, therefore, that if they drew closer to China, they would sort of undercut its, uh, the, uh, the possibility that the Shah would be assassinated by some sort of you know, Maoist-inspired Iranian student militant, um, but also various other factors, including the Shah's desire for uh, independent foreign policy um, and uh, uh, <clears throat> other uh, economic uh, and political changes that were happening at the time. Um, the, the main point that I'd like to drive home, though, is that, you know, even at the height of this revolutionary period, China was more interested in kind of stable diplomatic relations, traditional diplomatic relations, more so than a kind of revolutionary overturning of the established order. And that is for the most part because they didn't have the uh, resources to compete with the United States in the Middle East. And I think that's still true to this day. Um, you know, Jacobo can probably talk a little bit more about this, but the big, you know, thing that people are kind of scared of, I suppose, when they talk about this issue is the presence, you know, at least when I talk to people about it, is the possibility of the presence of Chinese troops or Chinese military designs in the Middle East. They talk about how many ships and, you know, airplanes the Chinese military has and soldiers. What they leave out is that many of these ships are extremely poor quality and of older design compared to the United States. Same with the, air, uh, the airplanes. I, I don't remember the exact figure, but we spend multiple times uh, what the Chinese government spends every year on its military. Um, so, you know, the idea that maybe at some level, some Chinese planners might want to do something like this, you know, I can't speak to their minds, but I can speak to the fact that they're simply not capable of doing, uh, you know, of, of, of opposing U.S. interests in the Middle East directly in that way. Um, so in terms of is this new, um, you know, with, throughout the after the relation between China and Iran improved uh, throughout the 80s and 90s, um, you know, there was a lot of different you know, ups and downs to the relationship. Um, on the one hand, Iran was one of, or China was one of the main uh, small arms suppliers to Iran during the Iran-Iraq war. On the other hand, they were one of the main arms suppliers to Iraq during the Iran-Iraq war. Like I should add, many countries, France, the United States, Russia, all did this uh, to a much greater extent than China. Uh, China was actually a small contributor comparatively. Um, but they assisted in the destruction of the country, and then they came and assisted in the reconstruction of the country. In the 1980s, uh, China was a major supplier of loans and construction workers to Iran. Uh, the Tehran Metro was largely built with Chinese assistance. Wow. Um, and that is a period that left a kind of more positive mark on Iran and China. It's also the period where China was the only country to publicly apologize to, uh, to uh, Ayatollah Khomeini for its previous support of the Shah. Um, I believe that Khomeini had sort of publicly said something like the, the Chinese have blood on their hands. And shortly after that, uh, during a state visit, you know, they openly apologized for the mistake of supporting the Shah's government against the will of the people. Um, you know, so that was a big PR moment as well. Um, over the next you know, couple of decades, I would say that the relationship proceeds in kind of fits and starts. At various points, you know, Iran and China have, diplomat have a, you know, commercial relations. The trade is never particularly high. Um, I think it peaked around $20 billion. That's not a huge amount of trade. Um, the oil, in terms of oil, you know, Iran is only the 10th or 11th uh, largest supplier of oil to China. I think it's like 3% of their overall reserves. Saudi Arabia, for example, is a 15 or 16 percent. Um, so just for comparison. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of cases of, you know, China on the one hand buying Iranian oil and giving them relief of the sanctions uh, or, um, you know, transferring military technology to Iran, um, sometimes via Israel as an intermediary. That's a very interesting story in and of itself. Um, but also in pulling out of a lot of deals like this, um, from oil deals to technology transfer, um, to even just economic development deals, often at the uh, under U.S. pressure, uh, you know, and often with the mentality of we can only lean so hard into our relationship with the United States before we have to counterbalance that with, uh, you know, the desires of other allies, or sorry, our relationship with Iran, before we have to counterbalance that with our relationship with the United States. And now, as I'm increasingly becoming aware, due to the work of people like Jacopo and Jonathan Fulton, like he's mentioned, um, the UAE, and Saudi Arabia and other countries uh, in the Gulf. So I think, sorry, just to pass it over to Jacopo, you can kind of talk about, um, you know, what's, uh, you know, in more recent and more specific terms, you know, what about this deal is new and what's been done before, et cetera. Well, okay. Um, well, I'll, 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 it's fun 
fantastic in you speaking about the history of this relationship. Because the, <laughs> yeah, no, it's Thank great. You. It's great because it's it's something that is is for well for myself. It's it's quite obscure, especially before the 1979 revolution. So, but it's so fascinating. Uh, I so haven't there, written the book yet, so as soon as I have, you can read uh, it. Yeah, read, yeah. And you can get read writing, my, my get dissertation. Writing, girl. Yeah. I'll be one of the first to read it, please. <laughs> so, um, well. Um, well, what I can say is, um, if I started my um, this conversation by saying that this is nothing really new, what I can say right now is also this is nothing really special, uh, in a sense that you know, okay, we have all this uh, noise around the still, all this 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 um, you know voices from the West, voices from Iran, um, which can can then talk about this. Uh, but at the end of the day, if we look at what China is doing in the Middle East, uh, Bill gave us some, some good historical uh, perspective. But if we look at what China has been doing, especially with after the launch of the Belt and Road Initiative, which was some sort of you know um, new start in China foreign policy in the Middle East, where they start to systematize a little bit more all their, their footprint in the region. Uh, basically, we see that what they did, and, and just to stop in the Gulf, you know, to, to limit our analysis to the Gulf, Persian Gulf, uh, what they did was basically uh, finding what they call the pivotal state of the region, which are actually free. And, you know, Saudi Arabia, obvious region, the largest, the UAE, probably the richest, probably the more, you know, commercially linked uh, to the region and, and, and the world, and Iran, because of course Iran is the biggest country in the region, is that with longest history, is, 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 is has a lot of potential, is uh, as a, as a huge uh, domestic market that needs, uh, you know, resources and so on. So Iran, it's actually an interesting country for China, as it should be for, you know, the Europeans, which are pushing for a deal that could let them to get back to uh, trade with Iran. Uh, as it should be for the United States itself, because again, we are talking about a country that has a huge history, uh, a lot of you know schooled uh, uh, population, and so on. So um, the reality is that what China is doing with Iran, so cutting this uh, comprehensive strategic partnership, is the same thing that China has done with Saudi Arabia and the UAE. So the thing is, these three countries, these three pivotal countries, are on the same level for China. Uh, this on paper, obviously, and uh, when I said, you know, um, this is not new in a sense that this deal took five years before being signed, is quite astonishing and quite telling if we compare it to the fact, for example, that um, the same level of partnership, the same comprehensive strategic partnership with the UAE was signed in 2018, and right now, you know, uh, it immediately resulted in expansion of China, uh, UAE trades, investment. And for example, the two countries right now are talking about uh, uh, producing uh, Chinese Sinovac vaccine in the UAE. So this is a, if you think about it, this is a huge development. Only countries that have, you know, profound uh, trade relations, trust, uh, diplomatic uh, alignment and so on can decide to do that, especially in this situation in which, you know, vaccine are probably the, the most important commodity in, in, in the current world. Um, if you look at what happened with Iran, the two countries decided to uh, progress and expand the relationship to this level in 2016, and it took five years to get to sign this. And, you know, and I'm quite skeptical to see, uh, you know, China going to produce Sinovac vaccine in Iran in, in, in the next few months or so on. Uh, so this, what tells you is two things, basically. One is that uh, China and Bill used this, this word a lot of time and is still very, very much applicable to the current situation is balancing. So China goes to the, to the Gulf, Persian Gulf goes to the Middle East with the idea of balancing, with the idea of uh, somehow presenting and trying to, to have this PR uh, approach uh, that distances himself uh, to the United States. So no more rivalries, no more feeding these rivalries, but balancing. We are friend of everyone. We propose win-win cooperation with everyone in the region. Um, at the same time, what else I was going to say, I'm forgetting this. Um, well, this was one thing. The other thing uh, come to my mind. Uh, what I want to add is, uh, 
uh, it's another thing that Bill was saying is, yes, I totally agree that China is not going to substitute the United States. Uh, I don't in the region. First of all, I don't think they are able right now. Uh, secondly, I don't think they are interested in doing that right now. Because uh, as, as a friend of mine, Italian researcher uh, put it uh, a couple of days ago, we had um, another Zoom meeting and so on. He said, you know, uh, for China, the Middle East is uh, the most important region among the, the least important. So <laughs> for them, you know, uh, Wow, it's, which which is which is somehow true, you know. Mm. For uh, for them, uh, of course, you know, there's this great power competition that even though they maybe they try to avoid this this term, but it's, it's going on. For at least for the United States, is is at the top priority. So they are caught in this United States trying to frame this competition as a great power competition. Uh, then they have the Asia Pacific region, South China Sea, and so on, uh, and then probably. In the second tier of this priority list comes the Middle East, comes Africa, mm -hmm. and so on. And, and the Middle East in this second tier uh, is, is, is quite important. But at the end of the day, uh, I mean, they have been in the last, let's say, 10 years, they have been very successful in the region without trying to substitute the United States. So the question is, why should they spend more resources, probably uh, breaking this sort of... Um, marriage made in heaven with the region where they, you know, they, they go there for business, they go there to cut deals, they go there to, uh, to propose win-win cooperation and, you know, uh, build this sort of security um, apparatus, the security um, construction that somehow is, is naturally uh, the beginning of, of problems as it was for the United States. You know, when you start feeding rivalries in the region, when you start taking sides, when you start, you know, selling too much arms and so on to the region, to, to different countries, then is where, you know, all the problems begin. And, and, and this is something that China smartly, because I think the Chinese, you can say everything about the Chinese, uh, um, you can be an apologist or whatever, what you can acknowledge though, is that they are very smart and they know what to do. <laughs> and they are doing that quite well in the Middle East, I think. Wow. Now, thanks, Bill. Thanks, Jacopo, for <laughs> contextualizing all of that. Um, um, uh, I would it, just it, like you know, to add to what. Yes, uh, please do. Yeah, to what Jacopo said. Um, you know, this is very much echoed by what is being said in the Chinese kind of academic foreign policy establishment. Um, this is important to recognize, right? Because some people will say, oh, well, they're just saying that and the kind of front facing to the other countries and what have you. But this is what they're saying to themselves. If you go and you read, um, you know, Chinese foreign policy journals and Chinese academics that are kind of talking to each other and to the government, Chinese think tanks, they all have this opinion. And, you know, it, China is also a place where, you know, um, there, there tends to be a very strong resonance for various reasons between what scholars are saying and what is acceptable and what is, you know, uh, uh, followed by government policy, so to speak. Um, and, you know, and they're all basically saying exactly that, that the Middle East is in, uh, not the most strategically important region uh, and that China has little practical reason to be involved militarily there. And they're saying this to Chinese generals and you know people within the Chinese establishment that would argue otherwise. But the general consensus is that this is an unwise position. Um, and you'll also, I mean, even just recently, um, there was a report that, you know, that China might potentially buy um, uh, or might potentially, uh, what is it, sell uh, military planes to Iran in exchange for oil. Um, this is one of the things that was supposedly in the deal that there was going to be this massive weapon exchange for oil instead of currency. Uh, and it looks like the deal's not going to go through. And the sort of, you know, commentary coming out of China from military advisors is basically, you know, China is under no obligation to give Iran free weapons, um, that it's not in our interest to do so, uh, and that it has to be for something beneficial and that we're not particularly interested in trading for oil right now. This goes back to the, the problem of, you know, sanctions making it difficult for Iran or China to directly trade, you know, anything of value besides, you know, uh, products or, uh, or things like that. Um, and, you know, I think it's worth, again, go back to history, you know, people are looking at this like, is China going, you know, is Iran going to lean towards China and become overly dependent on China? When the United States was trying to do this, this uh, the same thing that China is being accused of, they threw weapons at the Shah. I mean, they couldn't get them out of the door fast enough. If, if he wanted them, they gave them to him. 
So, I mean, the idea, the, the fact that there are Chinese generals saying we have no obligation to re really give Iran weapons under any circumstances other than extremely favorable to us in terms of how much money we're making, it's just a very different attitude. Totally. Wow. I, I mean, thanks for bringing up the weapons. I, I want to get back to that because uh, I think it's worth exploring just a little bit more because, you know, the moment you say weapons, it immediately becomes 10 times sexier than what it was before, right? <laughs> so, but before that, we actually have one question. I mean, it's kind of two questions. It's from uh, Rob Stark. And he asks, how will the deal affect China's relationship with Saudi Arabia? And historically, how well has China been able to balance relations with Iran and Saudi Arabia? Jacopo, you've mentioned, you've touched on it a little bit, but um, can either of you sort of elaborate a bit more about what well, the deal? I, I, I think we can split the, the two questions. You know, yes, uh, so history goes to Bill. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, oh, let, me, let, let me start, yeah, for the first question. Well, um, I don't think, you know, uh, this will have a major impact on, on China-Saudi um, relations. Uh, because once again, uh, if, if we look at this deal in the context, and we, again, take out all the noise that has been made around this deal, this is... It's not making Iran special. This is uh, really part of China's strategy in the region. And I think this is something that um, China has somehow made and Chinese diplomats have somehow made clear to uh, all the other partners in the region. Uh, it's not something that China is doing somehow, you know, in a, in a hidden way. They are doing, uh, you know, very clearly. Uh, and uh, the other thing is, you know, what could make the real difference is what will, at the end of the day, be implemented of this deal. So, um, and I think, you know, again, um, diplomats from the region, from Saudi Arabia, they are not stupid in a way. They know that this is great talk. This is a fantastic scenario. Again, what will be implemented is, is, is still um, unclear, is, is probably, um, an inch of what has been written in that document. Uh, and also what, I, what I, I know personally by talking with, with people from the Gulf is that obviously they have been a little bit, you know, scared by this. Uh, even, uh, even, you know, I'm always talking about, you know, high level politicians and so on. Uh, because, of course, um, it's clear that all the, the rebels that have been and all the fuzz, all the, the, the mess and all the noise that have been made around this deal is somehow you know, scary for them because uh, it will seem, especially, you know, there have been, and we can discuss maybe about this, but there have been some, some um, I would say, interesting people throwing in number, huge numbers Throw in the news like oh, we're uh, going to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Throw in uh, news like uh, uh, Iran selling uh, or renting whatever you would call it uh, islands in the Persian Gulf to China to to establish military bases and so on. So these are all quite quite scary news from the perspective of, for example, Saudi Arabia. Uh, I think that you know the Chinese uh, knows how to uh, basically you know reassure them. And they probably have been uh, have done that. If you think only think about, you know, um, they're very practical in my in my in my opinion. So, if you think about that, um, Wang Yi, so the Chinese Foreign Minister, signed this deal with Iran during a trip in the Middle East, and basically he visited Iran, yes, but he also visited Saudi Arabia, he visited the UAE, and so you know, it, it's quite clear that they want the message they want to send to the region is really about balancing is that look we are not uh somehow making this relationship with iran special this relationship is part of our strategy and and probably they are also you know um, the, the, the big announcement if if it was a big announcement i don't know we can discuss about this uh in saudi arabia was the discussion of this chinese plan for security and prosperity whatever they call it uh in the region so uh i think the message they will that they try to convey is that uh, okay we know what we are doing we're not you know turning uh, our self towards iran mm -hmm. you are more important and as bill said you know if we look at the figures right now even if china is buying iranian oil via malaysia and so on so all this this strange deals and and so on that are going on you know saudi arabia is massively more important right now for China than Iran in practical terms. The UAE, as we said, are much, much more important than Iran right now. So 
at the end of the day, I think, you know, leaders can be scared by this deal, yes, but when they look at the reality on the ground, they will definitely see that, you know, the relationship with China in Saudi Arabia and UAE is much stronger than that with Iran. And, and the reality how this is translated into real cooperation is far, far bigger in, in, in UAE especially and, and a little bit less in Saudi Arabia. So yeah, that's it. Um, just to pick up uh, very quickly on the, you know, the question of historically, how have they managed to balance them? Um, you know, very well, I would say very favorably. I was actually, actually, I would say that they have not balanced them uh, in Saudi Arabia's favor. Uh, and that prior to this deal, um, relations between Iran and China significantly lagged behind relations with Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Uh, Egypt also signed an agreement like this several years ago. Iraq signed one prior to Iran. Um, so there's five other countries in the Middle East with um, strategic comprehensive agreements. And if we go out further than that, Iran has... Um, various levels of whether they're strategic comprehensive agreements or just strategic agreements or just comprehensive agreements. They're all just basically boilerplate for the same thing um, with dozens. And, you know, I, I think it's, it's close to 50 or 60 different countries, um, you know, large and small. So it's no guarantee of what China's actual relation with them is going to be like. Um, and, uh, you know, in term, in real terms, um, you know, things that are, are mentioned in the, the document. And again, these things are only mentioned very nebulously in language like we pledge to increase cooperation between, you know, um, uh, uh, this and, you know, these various areas in banking, in, uh, you know, international terrorism and whatnot, um, joint military exercises. As I said, those are all things that happen all the time with the UAE and with Saudi Arabia, and which actually have even happened with China and Iran. There have been three joint military exercises in I believe the last um, four or five years, um, <clears throat> or possibly a little bit earlier than that. Like, so again, it would really just be bringing Iran-China relations in line with relations between um, you know, Iran and, and China, China and Iran's um, rivals, neighbors, however you wanna look at it. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I, I also would just like to mention um, what, something that you said at the end there, Jacopo, about like how it's being received. But actually, now that I'm looking at it, I think that's actually the next question, if you want to just uh, move on to that, Rowena. Yeah, yeah we've got the, the, the two questions that you mentioned. Uh, so we have two questions from Michael Bazif. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Firstly, um, well, the first question... people in Iran welcome the deal? Do they see it as a relief after years of pressure by the Trump administration? And secondly, how has Biden's Afghanistan announcement been viewed by the two governments, I assume China and Iran? And will this announcement impact future amendments of the deal? And I guess with the second, with the last question, we can bring in military, um, military, the, 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 mili the military fine print in, in the deal, let's <laughs> say, and um, whether that could be a future amendment. So, you know, can take off from there. Um, yeah, I can start with the question of how it's um, been received because I've written quite a bit about that recently. Mm -hmm. um, so, Great. I mean, there are a variety of reactions. So there's definitely no monolithic reaction. One can't really talk about what the mm -hmm. Iranian people think. Um, you can talk, what you can talk about is um, <clears throat> how, you know, if, if it's going to be good for, or if it's going to benefit or is seen by, to be benefiting um, certain groups, right? So f from the perspective of the Iranian state, um, there are definitely some benefits. We've talked about those already. Like Jacopo said, you know, this kind of breath of fresh air, breath of fresh air um, in terms of, you know, no longer feeling diplomatically isolated, a small measure of relief in terms of, um, you know, money, uh, from from purchase of oil, if that actually ends up, uh, and I should mention, you know, I, I, it, it is a very small amount of relief. I think it says a lot that even this tiny amount of an attempt to relieve the pressure and to push back against, um, you know, U.S. policy in the region is greeted by the foreign policy establishment as this kind of massive, overblown threat. The alarm bells are ringing loud and clear. Um, you know, I think it's 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 kind of ironic because it really is. It's, it's only a small amount of relief that they're trying to achieve here or that they could achieve here. Um, that being said, it's not so clear that it's going to be beneficial to the Iranian people. Um, if it 
benefits, if it's you know good for the JCPOA and it leads to the relief of sanctions, certainly that could, must be counted as a win for the Iranian people who are the main you know sufferers from uh, the sanctions as they currently exist. Uh, but other than that, um, you know, if the deals in terms of the deal were implemented, I, I'm not so sure. Um, the entry of uh, Iran of Chinese products into Iran has been uh, kind of greeted with a mixed bag. Um, you know, people who benefit from it certainly like it, but the people who have to buy the products, which are often of lower quality, people who uh, have to compete with the products or, you know, who compete with, um, you know, it basically creates a kind of race to the bottom situation, which has been well documented over the last decade. Uh, and a lot of Iranians complain about that. They see themselves as, you know, a kind of, you know, a country that should be coming into its own and should be, you know, out there and that they deserve better than what are frankly the, the lower quality end of products that China is able to produce, uh, at least in the last decade. And they're trying to change this now. But the majority of products sent to Iran are not the best because, as Jacopo said, it's just not the most important market available to China. Um, and because of the high risk involved in doing business there. Um, to, uh, to move on to how it's been received, um, by some in the Iranian government, it's been received very well. Um, they are there are proponents of it uh, who you know say that this is you know kind of America being defeated, and these are these are kind of tend to be the more more hardline um, you know, elements of the government um, that this is you know that um, but not necessarily. Again, this is a very these opinions vary widely across the spectrum. Uh, but they you know in in kind of terms of like ideal types of opinions that you might come across, some people are saying that this is you know the end of America and that China is going to offer offer a new way forward. Some people are saying that we should kind of chart a middle path, neither east nor west. We should balance. We should have good relations with America and China. Um, and so perhaps this deal is not so well advised if it means we're going to be leaning more towards China. Uh, there are pe members of the public that are, you know, in favor of it because of obvious reasons, you know, China is a huge economy. They think Iran should have good relations with it. They see it as a good sign of Iran having relations with foreign, you know, foreign power, you know, with, with other countries. Um, then there are many who see it as a bad sign. They are, you know, they're opposed to the Chinese government for all sorts of very reasonable reasons. Um, they, all the reasons that I mentioned about the entry of Chinese goods into, into Iran uh, and long and, you know, more deep seated anxieties, kind of like what Jacopo was talking about. Um, some of them based on inaccurate information, this, you know, these rumors that there are going to be military bases or that the country is going to be, you know, the, the island of Kish is going to be sold and things like that. And these are really powerful rumors. You have to remember in Iran, you know, the, the, the epithet of, you know, of, of Vatan Furush, like of the person who sells the country is still a very powerful memory. Um, you know, the, the, the history of concessions from the Qajar state to, you know, to Iran's, um, you know, what's perceived as Iran's over-reliance on the United States uh, and Britain at other times. Um, these are, you know, the history of colonialism. These are all really pertinent metaphors and histories and memories in Iran. So it's not taken lightly that, on social media, people have been, you know, saying, you know, you know, hashtag no to China in Iran and things like that for all of these reasons that, you know, both these kind of more sometimes dipping into kind of xenophobic racist rumors about you know, dirty Chinatown spreading all over Iran, but also the sale of islands, the sale of land, the dumping of nuclear waste into the Iranian desert. You know, all of these are untrue, but they're rumors that have been flying around. And that reflects a high level of opposition for uh, between you know, for many members of the Iranian public or, you know, reformist government officials and what have you. Um, but again, I have to stress, there's a very wide range of reactions. You can't say that there's any one um, way that it's been received within Iran. Yeah, if, if, if I can add something to this, you know, uh, one thing is that when the, the, the news of, the, of this deal uh, came out in, in July, June, July, whatever it was, 2020, it's interesting because it, it was firstly announced during a, a rally by uh, Ahmadinejad and he basically was the guy who said, you know, you see the government is uh, selling uh, the country to, to China and they are not telling you that, that they, are, they are doing that, which is uh, interesting for two reasons. One is that, you know, one of the period when Iran was flooded by uh, cheap Chinese goods and so on was uh, during Ahmadinejad's presence when he basically, Iran was under um, sanction again, that time where UN Security Council sanctioned and, and basically Ahmadinejad was saying, okay, you know, we, we, we leave the door open to China and, and, and so on. So 
uh, it's, it's kind of strange that the guy right now is announcing that deal while it was the one who basically opened the door to China uh, 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, whatever it was. Uh, the second interesting thing is that there's a lot of politics, and I mean, by politics, I mean Iranian domestic politics going on. As, as Bill was, was saying, you know, the views are very different. Uh, we should remember that um, um, in Iran, there will be presiden presiden presidential election in, in a couple of months from now. So um, I'm not sure how much this deal will be at the center of political propaganda, but it's certainly something that can be used exactly for the reason that Bill um, explained before. So how sensitive Iranians are about this uh, argument of, of selling the country to a foreigner country, a foreign leader, whatever it was. Um, the last thing is that we should not forget that uh, the history of China-Iran relations had some very unfortunate developments uh, in the past year, I would say, with coronavirus. Uh, it's very important to remember that Iran was the first country outside East Asia to uh, experience the pandemic, basically. And uh, there are some evidences uh, that uh, points with the fact that part of the, the virus came to Iran so quickly and well before the other countries because of some, uh, uh, let's say, illicit ties between the IRGC and China. Uh, let's say- Oh, I forgot all about this. <laughs> yeah, with Mahan hair. Oh, wow. Keeping flying to China despite the government wow. mm -hmm. uh, blocked all the flights to China. So, um, I mean, it's, it's a quite complex uh, issue, I would say from- <laughs> Yeah, they don't like to talk about that part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah. Um, let's select that. Um, <laughs> well, the, the question about uh, the, the, the US uh, uh, going away from Afghanistan 20 years after uh, the 9-11 mm -hmm. is an interesting one. Actually, I don't know how to answer to that one uh, in a sense that um, it's an interesting development, which I think both Iran and China will look closely. Um, I don't know what the impact of this deal will have in that. Uh, I guess it's difficult because I, I think, I think it's, for me, it feels like it uncomplicates the picture a little bit because mm. then you don't, you, you've removed physical American yeah. presence. On yeah, I think it's, it's kind of, it's probably not, I mean, honestly, my impression is that it's not strongly related. I mean, the main yeah, thing yeah. that's going to impact the Iran-China deal's implementation is the sanctions. So, I mean, you know, to yeah. the extent that the, Af uh, you know, the war in Afghanistan is related to, you know, America's overall objectives in the Middle East, and maybe by pulling that out, it'll also contribute towards something like that. You know, that, that's, that's kind of not necessarily an analysis I'm going to commit to at this time, but that's, maybe there's possibly something there. Um, but uh, I don't think any any sort of direct impact. Um, you know, the the there there isn't at this point any kind of military uh, you know component of the deal that's been set in stone or even really discussed um, seriously that we've been able to tell. Um, and in terms of you know, I mean, the United States still has Iran surrounded by plenty of military bases, so yeah. the lack of presence in Afghanistan is not going to change the the go. game significantly as as far as their calculations go. I think. Oh, yeah. wow, that's good. Interesting. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, what, what we will see for sure is is um, if, if they have not done so, is is Ryan's government and authority like you know, cheering the fact that the United States is going away from from the yeah. region or the extended region, whatever you would call it. And uh, but but at the end of the day, yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's, it's not going to have a real and, and clear impact on this deal. Uh, also mm -hmm. on, on China, Iran, arms trade, and so on. But it's certainly an interesting development. I would mm -hmm. say, you know, the interesting thing about China and Iran in terms of how do they see the region is that uh, for different reasons, maybe, uh, they both like, you know, the status quo. By that, I mean, Iran wants to control the militias around, uh, you know, the, the proxies or whatever you would call it. They want to have this sort of control. So uh, too much mass around where, where, where Iran cannot uh, you know, have control is an issue. And I would say for China, they are quite concerned that there can be, you know, all this uh, civil wars uh, with, with, you know, foreign fighters going around the region and so on. Uh, they're very worried about that because of, um, you know, possible um, terrorism spillover 
terrorist spillover in, in, in the Western provinces and so on. So somehow there can be some sort of, uh, which is one of the points that is in the deal actually, anti-terrorism and so on, cooperation, because mm -hmm. both have this, this idea of controlling and, and avoiding uh, terrorism or somehow, you know, um, other, other um, negative spillover, if you want to call it like that, that can harm the control in case of Iran and in case of of China that can, you know, somehow being risky for their own, um, um, yeah, or their own land and their own state. Yeah, I think, uh, and, I, um, sorry, sorry, no, go sorry ahead, but no, sorry, but no, it's just that we have another comment, but um, yeah, it, it, I was just also going to try and tie in our discussion a little bit because we've got five minutes left right. and uh, it went yeah, by and so looking quickly at that comment it's going to probably be tough to address that in five exactly minutes. but um <laughs> so, uh, but maybe maybe we'll I have know. to leave that one for another we might time. have to leave it but i uh, just wanted to say thank you very much to farhad khodusi for bringing that up about u.s and china rivalry in the region and how it yeah. impacts and whether you can talk about different camps in the middle east who's pro iran who's oh, sorry who's pro u.s who's pro china mm. but I don't think we can address that in the last five minutes. So, um, but hopefully another discussion. We just need to have more of these, I think. Yeah, Yeah. my, my general reaction to things like that is that, you know, it's very difficult to predict the future. I'm a yeah. historian, so I'm not, certainly not no. going to try, uh, <laughs> you know, but uh, I, I, uh, you know, to me, it smacks of a kind of, of this kind of Cold War crisis logic of, you know, um, that yeah. this is what is, um, you know, this is what needs to be done and that in the future there's going to, you know, the, do the dominoes are going to fall in this way and that way. And, you know, I just, I, I don't think, I, I don't think that that's what's going to happen on the basis of everything we said, everything Jacopo said about, you know, China's short and medium term goals in, in, in the Middle East. If China develops a capacity to actually oppose, you know, um, U.S. military power projection in the Middle East, then perhaps that would be a different conversation. Um, but, you know, despite all the noise being made about that, I, I don't think that that's happened at the present time. And I don't think that there is any chance that that's going to happen rapidly in the next five or 10 years either. Yeah, exactly. I, I agree totally with, with Bill. Absolutely. 100%. In the last few moments we have, I actually have a question for Jacopo. I mean, you know, or, or rather yeah. something I'd like to hear him talk about some more. So Jacopo, you mentioned do, a moment do, ago do. Um, about, you know, these numbers being thrown around by shady people. Um, you know, we've both uh, written and talked a little bit about this, but I just would, you know, I've, I've, I've heard my own voice plenty. I want to hear you talk now about, um, you know, what exactly uh, is the origin of that kind of $400 billion um, figure that's being thrown around and what kind of shadowy figures <laughs> are you referring well, well. to? <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm exaggerating, but. <laughs> well, well, th th this is an interesting story. So uh, mm. basically what happened in, in was uh, September, 2019. So we're going back a couple of, well, two years, almost one year and a half. So, uh, I'm not, I'm not gonna, gonna I'm not gonna tell names, okay? So, <laughs> you know, leave it. But it was this very interesting and surprising article on a on a, um, I would say second tier publication or not not you know foreign policy magazine focused on oil and 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 all this this commodity world. And, and it's quite connected to the oil industry, is that correct? Yeah, oil industry, exactly, exactly. Yeah, industry it's, magazine, basically. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Which published an interesting article saying that. Iran and China were going to sign a $400 billion deal. Uh, and this $400 billion were divided between, you know, I think 100 or something like that thrown into Iran oil industry and the other half in general investments in the country. When I read it, uh, I, I, I was like, well, this is not going to happen in a sense that <laughs> this, this is like, you know, a uh, what the hell is that? It's, it's, it's going to, you know, it's going to make Iran the richest country in, 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 in the world. I would probably, I would probably move to Iran to enjoy some of this. You know? Go to Kish Island. Um, and get a job know? in Chinese construction work yeah, tomorrow. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, I mean, um, what the hell is that? So, um, um, I start looking a little bit into that and, 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 uh, Basically, uh, Yar from uh, uh, Boston Bazaar, uh, we were talking about chatting about this. We were not, you know, not very, we were very skeptical about this. 
And so I, I wrote down an article where I said, okay, I'm, I look into some figures. I look at um, Belt and Road Initiative, how big that was, uh, you know, if it was even possible to derive an economic observe such a huge amount of money thrown in, in, in you know, from a, from a foreign government. And, and what we saw was that, you know, this was totally implausible and was basically fake news. Um, and the interesting thing is that, uh, unfortunately, this figure has been, you know, uh, since then, uh, came out a lot of time and basically tons and tons of uh, articles uh, from, you know, the, the, the third and fifth tire publication to the New York <laughs> Times, which keeps quoting this, this figure, uh, which has been, you know, denied by Iranians, um, um, authorities, Chinese authorities. It's not in the figure of this deal. Uh, there's no mention of that, uh, except from that article, which originated all the mess about that. Uh, it keeps coming out. Um, despite, I mean, I tried and other people like Bill and, and other colleagues tried to, you know, point out the fact that this was totally implausible and exaggerated. The interesting thing is that at some point, I don't know when this happened, but uh, the article that uh, first talked about this uh, disappeared. It's no more on the website. So uh, it's basically, you know, something that um, has been lost in the, in the internet and get lost in the internet. So we have this figure that is keep flowing, floating around uh, without the original sources, which has been canceled. And so it's one of the mystery of this uh, China-Iran cooperation and China-Iran deal, I would say. Um, I have my theories about why this figure <laughs> has been thrown in. I don't know if they're true. I had some, some dubious about, um, some doubts about the, the person who wrote that article. I even thought it was, it was not existing. It was like a, a fake persona, but um, <laughs> Bill and, and, and I don't know who was that point, pointed out that there are videos of him on YouTube. So it, it exists. And, uh, but it is interesting because there are, there are a lot of misconception, a lot of, um, I would say politically motivated to put it bluntly. Uh, figures and data and, and, and news about uh, Iran and China uh, floating around. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And like the, the article, you can actually you can still see it on the Wayback Machine. Yeah. Um, and it, it's also the source, the first source I can find of um, any mention of military. You know, the article itself says something like the deal will also include 5,000 Chinese boots yeah, on the exactly. ground, you know, or something like that. Um, so it really does seem to be the source of all this. And it's only after that that you see all these blog posts and articles being like China has reportedly signed a $400 billion deal that could lead to the selling of this and that. So it's really it's ground zero as far as i'm concerned yeah, um, yeah. and it, it says a lot you know i mean you know we're not going to get into our conspiracy theories or whatever but it does say a lot that the ground zero of those claims was an oil industry tied magazine from a uh a, a, a article that has since been taken offline and um you know I, 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 from someone who does not have a very prominent uh presence a public presence in the field in any field really yeah. um so it's just it's just worth remembering all of those things uh, and you know it's one of those one of those things that there's nobody in the media that sues you if you say something completely off the wall about Iran. Yeah. There's no libel consequences or anything like that. So people really can say yeah. whatever they want. Um, and, you know, we need to be really cautious. There's a lot of other, I mean, you know, when you even look into the first, first time I ever heard anything close to this figure was 2016, when they were saying that Iran and China had signed a, a deal to increase trade, that they had pledged to increase trade and signed a deal to increase trade to 600 billion from, I think it was 20 billion at that time. So a slightly different, you know, um, thing that they're saying. It's not an investment. It's increasing mutual trade to 600 billion by, I think it was 2025. Yeah. Um, and first of all, trade between Iran and China went down over the next few years uh, to the lowest point, actually, um, due to the, the sanctions for the most part and the resumption of maximum pressure, because that that pledge, that deal, you know, the beginnings of the discussions of the current deal is what it basically was, began um, under the after the signing of the JCPOA and collapsed after the JCPOA was America pulled out of it. Um, and the, uh, the um, oh, goodness, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what did I what did I what was I just talking about? Um, the, the 600 billion. Right, the six hundred billion dollar figure. If you even look at the news stories at the time, it was a mistranslation. All of the Iranian sources said they were in discussion 
of a deal that may target increasing trade to 600 billion. And they were talking about this deal, which wasn't signed until five years later. But it was reported in the American press as China and Iran have signed a deal to in- and then pledged to increase. But it was just opening the discussions. And it's a small translation error, but I think it's a but deliberate one, personally. Yeah. A deliberate one, well. Yeah, most probably, probably, yeah. Yeah, most probably. It's just to keep to keep the fire burning. But we're already we've already passed four o'clock. So uh but no, that's fine. It's a very interesting discussion. I really learned a lot. I just want to say thank you to Jacopo and Bill for your yes. for, for really taking us through the Iran China deal, uh, giving us a historical perspective, contextualizing the deal, and really just you know demystifying these big numbers that have been thrown around in the press and on Twitter. So really, really appreciate that. I hope you both had a great time as well. And um, if there's any final words, please do, please do say them now. Well, well, if I can say one thing, uh, what yes, we said today in one hour was really one inch for what could be said yeah, about this deal. I know. Yeah, and so, absolutely. Uh, myself, Bill, and other, you know, fantastic people have written a lot in that. So if you, mm. sometimes, you know, uh, well, Bill is publishing on The Diplomat, so pretty established uh, Definitely. established news outlet. Other friends are published on Washington Post and so on. But, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, try to find the, the right sources. And, and like, you know, absolutely. we are all young people that are much more probably committed that, than some more, you know, established journalists and so on that, that get sources from, from that hoddish, strange uh, mm. people <laughs> in the field. So, you know. Shadow world. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So use us, use us. Absolutely, please. And that's why, that's why we have you here today, is, is, to, is to draw on your expertise, your youth, your experience, your knowledge, your training. So yes, definitely, please. I, I, you can check. Jacopo and Bill are both very active on Twitter. Much. So you can find you can find all their writings, so please check them out. Uh, any yeah, last I use I use hashtag Iran China. He uses hashtag China Iran. Okay, there. <laughs> <laughs> I've been using hashtag Iran China. Okay. Oh no, I'm just teasing. Okay. <laughs> I told him the other day he should change his name to yeah, China yeah, Iran yeah. guy. China <laughs> Iran guy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but thank you so so very much. Uh, it was really really great. So we'll just say goodbye to YouTube now. Thank All you very right. much for everyone. Bye bye. <laughs> Tuning in. Thank you. Thank you. So I've ended the stream, by the way.